I know we're going to have some more people coming, but we have a very full cool evening, and so uh, if they miss my recap of what we've done in the first two evenings, that won't be as, as serious as if they were to miss what our speakers have to say. So I want to, like last time, just give you a very short overview of what I heard in the first two sessions, and then you can agree or disagree uh, with me. So first of all, remember we looked at um, the sunlight towards sustainability, and uh, I, I think we have no choice in, in our quest for sustainability other than to stumble along because we really don't know how to get there. And we're going to make a lot of missteps. The important thing is that we're headed in, in the right direction. And as I mentioned, I think when it's all done, if we achieve sustainability, and people look back, it's going to resemble more the classic drunkard's walk in statistics than it is a straight walk. Mary? Yes? How do you define a slight error? A slight error? Well, it's, it's statistically, I guess it's with, with, within a, a standard deviation or so, uh, probably occurring. And again, I think it, but the, what we're dealing with if, if we worry about really accurate accuracy, we're not going to make it. Remember, the Brundtland Commission defines sustainability as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And I think we saw in the first two that in terms of our use of energy, we have not uh, had sustainable development. We have compromised the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And when we talk about agriculture tonight, uh, I think we'll see the same thing. You guys added a whole lot of new dimensions that you wanted to have for sustainability, and I'm going to give you copies of all of these again tonight. And we looked at nuclear power. This was the list we used last time. The only one I added, because I had forgotten it, was the last one uh, that came up. And one of the, the big knocks against nuclear is the very long time to, that it takes to permit new plants in the United States. That's not true in other countries. As we know, in, in China, uh, they have 50 that are in various stages of construction that will be operating within 20 years. So transitioning to renewables. This is what we talked about now last time at PO. And I thought he gave a really very good overview of the quest for a renewable uh, portfolio. But in 2008, we had 75% of US electric power uh, was fossil fuels, 10% nuclear. And I thought his number was a little low, but he's the expert. Hydroelectric, 10%. Renewables were less than 4%. And the best predictions of his industry are that by 2035, nuclear will be about the same. Uh, this is in the US. Um, fossil fuels will still provide almost 80% of the total. Renewables will be up, will be about 17% up from nine, uh, and so increasing something like 2.8% per year. And in, in his analysis, and his company is betting their future on what this portfolio will look like. Biomass and wind, wind are the big winners, and solar makes a little bit of progress, but it's not going to be like we heard last night from Woody Clark that everybody is going to have solar on their garage and on the tops of their cars and on, um, everything. Natural gas and renewables uh, will account for the majority of the additions to the energy capacity in 2035, the additions. And then we talked about, do we need a doomsday plan? And that point was made, the climate has really always been twitchy throughout geologic time. It's been all over the place. And that we humans are very fortunate to live at a time when climate it has allowed us to thrive and that we should do everything we can to avoid from making climate any twitchier than it is would be in the absence of human beings. If you look at CO2 levels in the atmosphere, they are going to continue to grow for at least the next 50 years. And just remember the slide before, and it feel so, and, and perhaps much longer because it's going to be tough to wean ourselves off of fossil fuel and we've still got lots of fossil fuels left. We're already above what many scientists consider to be dangerous levels of CO2 and, uh, and the methane levels are going to increase 
because of the melting of permafrost and other sources, and on molecule by molecule basis, methane is about 25, 24 times as powerful as greenhouse gas and CO2. So we are on a trajectory to have a warmer Earth, higher standard of sea level, all of those things, even if we were able to stop all further emissions of greenhouse gases tomorrow, it would be a warmer Earth with those things. And then the question then becomes, should we evaluate potential climate intervention, intervention strategies? Should we? Do we have an ethical responsibility to our grandchildren, our children, to at least ask the question, should we be ready to intervene if it becomes necessary? It's like that wonderful cartoon of two dinosaurs, and one dinosaur is saying to the, to the other, shouldn't we at least consider the possibility of an asteroid? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here, here you see, that these are uh, years down here, uh, the, the pointer, years down here, ppm of CO2 uh, on the ordinate, and BAU is business as usual, and if we did all the things that we talked about, the various proposals, the levels of CO2 would come down to that purple line, but they would still be almost 800 parts per million by 2100, and we've got the experts who are telling us that anything above 380 is a problem for future generations. Now, there are two fundamentally different approaches to uh, climate intervention. The first is solar radiation management, and that is where you intervene and you keep some of the solar radiation from reaching the Earth's surface. And you can either inject things into the upper atmosphere, like aerosols, the way volcanoes do, uh, but you could do it in a different way, or, or you could also brighten clouds, because clouds keep a lot of solar radiation from reaching the Earth's surface. And one of the most interesting proposals is to pump seawater up into low-lying clouds, make them brighter and whiter, and you reflect some of the solar insulation. So then you're not dealing with the CO2 in the atmosphere, but there's less energy coming in, so it has less of an effect. Or you have the equivalent of atmospheric liposuction. You remove CO2 from the atmosphere, and you store it. You can store it in saltwater aquifers, you can put it in the bottom of the ocean, but those are basically the two different strategies. And I think it's clear that we do not know enough about either one of those that you would want to advocate going out and doing them. So the question becomes though, should we learn enough about them, should we do the research, so that if it were to become necessary, you would know what to do. And that's, I'm, I'm not going to try to answer that question for all of you. I think you each should come to your own conclusion. But I think it's, a, it's an important question. Now, so the second of our two big insults on the planet for human beings is the way that we grow and harvest the foods that we eat on land and in the ocean. And we are going to hear about those tonight. And so our first speaker, let me pass these around though so people can take one in case you want to have a copy of what I just put up on the screen. And we're first going to talk about uh, sustainable foods that we, or what we eat, how we grow them. Russ Parsons is food editor and columnist for the Los Angeles Times. He's been writing about food for 25 years, including 20 years at the Times. He's the author of a number of very important books. I have a couple, several of them here tonight. How to Pick a Peach, which came out in 2007. A quite a remarkable book. And also, How to Read a French Fry. Quite a <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, And Russ lives here in Long Beach. He's a member of James Beard's Foundation's Who's Who of Food and Beverage in America. So a member of the Hall of Fame for the food world by <coughs> being listed uh, by in the James Beard list. He's won every major American food journalism award there is, including those from the International Association of Culinary Professionals, the Association of Food Journalists, and the University of Missouri Lifestyle Journalism Awards. This, this book was a finalist for two Julia Child Cookbook Awards, and How to Pick a Peach uh, was named one of the best 
two, the two best books in 2007 by Publishers Weekly and Amazon. He has, uh, before going to the Times, he worked for other papers in Here Los Angeles. Uh, <laughs> he, wait, before that, he wrote about high school football, professional rodeo, and cops, and courts, and country music. And here's another one. Uh, and so, who, who's going to win the, the, the Laker Utah Jazz? You wrote about sports. Oh, man. I put a Laker fan on the spotlight. <laughs> All right, now, as soon as I get over there, Right with Everybody here okay? I don't think I need a microphone to room this small. I, I think the microphone on the is going to record. Oh, okay. Okay? This is recorded? This is recorded and it's broadcast all over the northern hemisphere. <laughs> <laughs> so be careful what you say. Exactly. <laughs> It's the whole stumbling part, right? This is right. It's all about stumbling. So, what's all this stuff about sustainable? And uh, does that mean, uh, do I have to just eat organic foods? <laughs> um, the, uh, the, I, I like to think of sustainability and, and as it applies to agriculture. It's kind of the Obama era of organics. And that means that sustainability is based on, uh, on, on having, um, high aspirations, but also a, a pragmatic approach. So you dream big, but you do what works, but, and it works at that time. Uh, the, the, uh, according to, there's a, uh, the, the sustainability I mean, is, is, is really poorly defined. And it basically, it's kind of, it's a philosophy that varies depending upon who you're talking to. There is an association of, of uh, sustainable farmers, and they, I, I think they have the kind of, they sum it up pretty well. Um, and they have a, it's a kind of a three-legged stool approach. Um, this is sustainable farming means farming so that you take care of the soil, farming so that you take care of, of the future generations, and farming so that you take care of the uh, of your farm. Uh, and by that they mean the economic health of the farm, because. You're not, if you're a sustainable farmer, it doesn't matter how perfect you are. If you're not making enough money to pay the, the land bills, somebody else is going to be using your land next year. And they may or may not be as, as, uh, as, as, as thorough as you are. Um, but as, uh, one farmer I talked to, I think, summed it up really well. He said that for him what sustainable farming was about was that instead of farming for the next quarter or farming for the next year, you're farming for three generations down. And so that's how you make the decisions. And that does it, what that, that, that all sounds really great, right? But what's, what are the rules? And that's the great thing about sustainability, uh, is the definition, is that it's a philosophy, it's not a set of rules. And that when you get into rules, then you begin to, in, if philosophy breaks down. And I think that's, personally, I think that's what's happened with the organic movement, uh, that it's become, that the organic, movement started with a broad overarching philosophy of, of how to grow, how agriculture could be. Um, and then partly through their own efforts, because they got really upset about other people claiming to be organic when it wasn't when they weren't, um, uh, it, it became regulated. And so now there is, you know, there's a set of regulations this thick about what makes an organic farm and what's permitted and what's not permitted. And a lot of it, a lot of those things have nothing to do with what was the original philosophy. And a lot of the things that were in the original philosophy have fallen by the wayside. And so sustainability kind of leaves it to the farmer to say, it's your land, do what's, do what's right for it. Do what you think is right for it. And if you think that what's right for it is using, um, using nitrogen, uh, for, nitrogen based fertilizers when you need it, well, that's your call. Think three generations down. It's not, a, it's not a replacement for um, for for other for, for uh, 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 organic forms of of, of of fertilizer, but it's an, it, can, it can be an augment. And it's the same thing with with pesticides and with um, and with fungicides and herbicides. But let's stay with that. When, when we put agriculture on the list of, of being the, the having the greatest impact on, on the earth. Uh, 
of any human activities other than, than energy, it is because of the large amount of fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides that, that we have used, also soil e erosion. We've got 400 dead zones now in the world ocean. Um, the dead zones result because there's too much life in the, the ocean, mm -hmm. and then the, the plants die, they sink to the bottom, they exhaust the oxygen. You look at one in the Gulf of Mexico, it's because of agricultural input. Exactly. So yeah. how, how do we, if we don't, if, if, even if we don't have really strict rules, how can we somehow reduce the amounts of nutrients, the fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides? It's a slow, it's, I think it's going to be a slow process. Um, but it's but it, it's a process that's already happening. Um, and but I when I talk about this, I'm talking about it from the point of view of a Californian, which means that California farming is based on things that, growing things that people eat, fruits and vegetables. The rest of the country, agriculture means something can mean something else entirely. It can mean corn or soy or cotton. And, I, and I, when you talk about the dead zones in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. Obviously, that's not coming from the California Central Valley. That, that's coming from Minnesota and from the, from the great grain growing area. But what's happened in California is that in the last, over the last decade, every year, pesticide use is reduced. And what, another thing that's really amazing is, uh, is the report that the last uh, uh, pesticide report that was released, annual pesticide release, uh, report that was released by the California Department of Agriculture, that 25% of all of the pesticides that were used in California last year uh, were copper sulfate, which is an organic, uh, an organic uh, fungicide and, uh, and pesticide. So, I mean, that's 25% of all of them that were used is this one specific organic. So what's happening is, instead of being polar, a bipolar, <laughs> Instead of having instead of having two uh, two camps that are hundreds of miles apart, what's happening is that we're meeting in the middle, and I think that's what sustainability is all about. I mean, it's about reducing everything to the absolute minimum. But you know, I, mean, it's, I have a garden in my yard, in my uh, I have veg uh, four raised vegetable beds in my in my in, in my front yard, and I'm a horrible gardener. And I think about what I would be like if I was a farmer. Good Lord, you know, I mean, my, my family would be starving. And I know really, really good farmers, and I know some really good farmers who are pure organic. Some of my best friends are, are, are great organic farmers. Mas, Masamoto is a terrific, terrific guy. But that's farming with an extra degree of difficulty added in. It's so going to have to be recorded twice. <laughs> okay. And some of my favorite farmers are, are not organic, but, but they all use as little as possible. I mean, there's a way to, uh, we're not, the, the, the dividing line is it between not using it at all or overusing it grammatically. You know, there's a way that things can be used correctly and used when they're needed. Should I turn the other one off? No, we need to one on. Okay. Uh, and then used when they're needed as a backup. And, and reducing the amounts that are used saves farmer money. So you can, there are lots of places now that Farmers, large farm crops have, have been mapped out and, and they, they, they have GPSs on their tractors and mm -hmm. they know where they have to put more fertilizer and they know where they can put less fertilizer without reducing wood. Well, even beyond that, they're using satellite images yes. to, track, to track where, uh, you know, where, where the nitrogen uptake is. I mean, it's a, it's farming, to that, farming today is not 40 acres and a mule. It's nobody <laughs> like that. It's, I mean, these guys, these guys, there's a lot of them who are really on top of things and they really know what they're doing. And, you know, there's some really bad actors, but it's not that black and white division anymore. I mean, yeah. organic farming was, I mean, the organic philosophy was originally, you know, that it was based on scale, it was based, you know, small farms. Yeah. It was based on, on things like uh, building the soil by fallowing so that, you know, so that you had if you had six months with, with plants that you were working and six months with either a cover crop or it was, or it was, it was uh, um, allowing, time, uh, allowing the earth time to, to recover, none of those things are in the organic legislation anymore. I mean, in, in scale, earthbound farms is one of the biggest farms in California. It's 40,000 acres, more than 40,000 acres now, and it's organic. I want to come back to the 40 acres and the mule and, <laughs> and Wendell Berry, but California, 
largest agricultural economy in the United States, twice that of Texas, which is number two. And I think we, the, the and that's most, a lot of cattle. That's right. Most of the money comes from fruits and vegetables, but California agriculture is still, we, we use water in California as if we were a third world country. Mm -hmm. Over 75% of all of the developed water, that is the water that is available for, for use, goes to agriculture. <coughs> Should we really be growing alfalfa and cotton and rice in a state like California? I ask you, Russ Parsons. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, no. I mean, that's crazy. We get it's we crazy. It's on tape, Russ. Uh, I know. It's okay. I've, 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 done that. I've said this before. I thought it comes as a shock to anybody. It's crazy that it, and water politics in California is so Byzantine in water, the, the way water is divided up. I mean, there are farmers in the, in the southern part of the Central Valley where that's what they farm is water because you know their ancestors had the foresight to to, uh, to buy the land where the where headwaters came down into the valley. And so everybody who uses any of that water has to pay them a royalty on it. That's what they do. And if they don't use it, they, they very well could lose the right to lose that water it. in the subsequent year. It pays not to conserve. Right. And you know, you only buy up that money. No, I think that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm afraid that's a it's global West, issue. Well, <laughs> it's at least Western water law, though. Yeah. Yes. And, and you know, and when you drive up, when you drive up the uh, Highway 5, or when you go to the food, you drive up the 99, you see there's a difference between the right side of the road and the left side of the road. And that's a difference between the East Valley and the West Valley. And the East Valley um, is walked, there, there is water. I mean, the King River, it's a pretty good watershed. The water table is growing down, but it's, you know, it's manageable. The West side of the valley is that area where there's, first of all, there's no reason for anybody to live there. And, the second, and second of all, I mean, there's no reason for, for that to be farmland. I mean, maybe maybe grazing land or something like that that you, that, that doesn't take uh, that doesn't take that kind of water input. And California farms are still, and particularly when you're talking about field crops, and they divide between field crops and and, um, and, and fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables in the agriculture world, fruits and vegetables, oddly enough, are considered a specialty. Uh, and fruits and vegetables and as specialty crops, they get no. There's no direct subsidies from the government. There's, you know, I mean, it's it's just it's mind-boggling. But field crops, um, they use water like they were in Iowa. And they were pulling out of the Mississippi, and they still use overhead sprinklers. It's just it's crazy. It, it is it's crazy. So let's go back to 40 acres and a mule. Everybody know who Wendell Berry is. Wendell Berry is a wonderful essayist, one of the best writers ever. He calls himself a, a poor Kentucky farmer uh, because he does do some farming. Uh -huh. But he argues that if we went back to the family farms and if we all bought locally, we wouldn't have a lot of these big issues that we have. What do you think? I think Wendell's a good writer. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, that, that you can make a really convincing argument for that. Um, in However, a way, in a, with a population, when you live in California, yeah. it's, it's, it's a lot easier argument to make. Uh, in the first place, we're not that far from that in California. In California, 80% of all of the farms are owned either by individuals or by families. 75% um, of the farms are less than 100 acres. Now, what what goes wrong is the is the economic system. You know, when, when they talk about hunger and when they talk about food supply, everybody, most everyone agrees that for the most part, there's enough food that's grown. It's in the distribution. And it's the distribution that's the problem with California agriculture. But it's not, not just a matter of huge factory farms. It's a matter of an economic system that forces small farmers to behave as if they were huge factory farms. And, you know, I mean, that, I can go on forever about that, but there's, you know, it's, it's a complicated, there's no incentive for a farmer to grow anything with any flavor. There's an incentive for growing more, but there's no incentive for quality because everything that you grow gets mixed in with what everybody else grows so that they can supply the supermarkets on the East Coast. But in Quebec, you know, the, the, the idea of uh, buying locally, there's a wonderful area between Chesapeake Bay and Delaware Bay. It's called the Del Mar yeah. Peninsula, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia. And it was always described in the literature as a place a, a quilt, a, a patchwork quilt of farms 
started with fishing villages. Most of the fishing villages have been gone now for a number of decades because of the collapse of fisheries. And, and the farms are being subdivided in, into, um, for development. For, and, and we ran a, a workshop several number of years ago, before I came here, so I guess eight or nine years ago. And, and the uh, farmers would say in this workshop, we, we've got kids that are going to go to college. We have two choices. We, we can either believe in not-for-profit farming, or we can subdivide and we can get a, make a lot of money, send our kids to college, we can have a little, a little tiny farm out of the big one, and we can grow enough food to satisfy our families. And it will change the landscape of that part of the country forever. So we, we, part of our challenge was from Congressman Wayne Gilchrist to figure out ways if we're going to subsidize everything else, could we subsidize the family farmer? The family farmer. What, do you, what do you think about that? I think it's a, I think it's a great, a great idea. I think we ought to be subsidizing people who grow fruits and vegetables. We should not be subsidizing people who are growing corn. I, I don't think we should be subsidizing people who are growing cotton. I mean, there's, there's enough for really not in the world. Yeah. Um, and, and we're lucky here in California. I mean, I, I became very, very sensitive to that because my last book was about it was about agriculture and how it works, and, and there's a lot of seasonality and local. I'm not quite a local board, but um, there's a lot of about the, you know, the benefits of eating local, about getting what's, what's grown closest to you. Uh, and when I went on book tour to the northern Midwest and to the Northeast, boy, they had me for lunch. I mean, it was like, <laughs> and if that's easy for you to say in California. It was, we're here, we're going to be eating root vegetables and kale for six months out of the year. But I mean, that's why we moved here, right? We were smarter than they were. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, if you, I know you like to go to uh, farmer's markets. You go with that over dinner. But tell, tell us, nobody's listening. Do you ever go into an Albertsons or a Bonds? All the time. Yeah. All the time. Uh, you know, I, I probably, I, I guess if I broke it down, I would probably buy half of my half of my produce from Trader Joe's. Um, probably 40% of it from farmers markets and maybe 10% from an Albertsons. Um, I'm kind of ecumenical about it, or maybe promiscuous about it. Um, <laughs> like I, I'm going to buy what's best, uh, and, and so and, and also what's convenient. I mean. I wrote a column a couple of weeks ago about uh, the, the, the problem with farmers markets. Everything is wonderful about farmers markets, except they happen four hours a week in one particular spot. And if you're not there at that time, you're out of luck. And a lot of times, you know, I mean, I work for a living. I'm out of luck. And so I'd love to go to this to the uh, Sunday market uh, at the marina or to the Saturday market in Torrance. And there's a great market down here in downtown, um, at downtown Long Beach. Um, and, and, and I try to go as often as I can, and if I had a choice. But I think that's part of the whole sustainability thing. It, it comes back to that kind of, to kind of a common sense, middle of the road approach. Um, my view towards all of that is that, that every time you're buying food, you're voting for a system. And it's just like democracy, it's not a pure system. But if you cast more good votes than you do bad votes, you're doing okay. Well, anyway, as we were telling you over then, we, we go to the one downtown, Billy downtown, one oh, by on Broadway, 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 and uh, it, it, was that sustainably grown telephone, do you think? We <laughs> 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 were tell, telling Russ over there that uh, there are a couple of people there we just like to buy from, and the one guy, he's an elderly farmer, a very nice, gentle, kind person, and the selection that he has isn't very good. We always buy from them. We, we don't always eat what we buy. <laughs> right, Margaret? <laughs> She's going to pretend she doesn't know. But you know, here, here in Southern California, we're really lucky. I mean, there is really local food. Now, a lot of the guys in farmers markets are coming up from Fresno, or coming down from Fresno, or they're coming up from North County, San Diego, some from OC. But there are local farmers here. Um, uh, the, uh, SCE has a program where farmers can rent out the the, uh, the, the land under the power lines, and there and there are several uh, there are several urban urban farms that are going on under the power lines. It's great. It's, it's, just a, it's such an innovative and, and kind of <coughs> that, to me that's what sustainability is about. 
Do you worry at all about eating any of those crops that grow up? Yes, I don't. No, I wouldn't. I'm kidding. But, <laughs> all right. So I want to know. Uh, we, we know scientifically. We have the technology and the science. We could reduce the, uh, the environmental burden of agriculture. We could reduce the amount of land that it takes to feed the world. We could reduce the amount of water. We could eliminate the, the need for pesticides and herbicides. It's called genetically modified agriculture. Do you eat anything that's genetically modified? Yeah. Tofu. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I mean, in, in, in the United States right now, I mean, this is a really hot, it's, a, it's such a contentious topic. And, you know, it, and I'm not sure where I come down on it from week to week. Uh, but in the United States, there are, there are uh, there's only one um, genetically modified food or vegetable that's grown. And that, that's papaya from Hawaii. Because they had a really, they've got a really bad virus there. And if they hadn't come up with a genetic modification for the papaya tree, uh, there would be no papayas in Hawaii. They, they would be wiped out. And that's the kind of, the, the really tough decision that everybody, this, 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 yeah. that it comes down to. Now, I mean, 80% of our soybean crop is genetically modified. Um, so I guess, if, you know, if you're worried about GMO, don't eat the tofu, but I eat the tofu. Um, the thing that bothers me about GMOs, there's two things that bother me about, about GMOs. One of them is they're not labeled. There's no requirement that they should be labeled. I really think as a matter of fairness, they ought to let the consumer make the choice about what they want. The other thing that really bothers me about GMOs is that in large part, so far, most of them have been developed for, for corporate convenience, not because they're making the product any better. They're making, I mean, most of, most of what's, uh, most of the GMOs that are in production right now are, are, um, are, are uh, have been developed because they're resistant to specific herbicides. And that's, that can be a really good thing because there's such a thing as no-till agriculture. I mean, that's a real theory that, 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 you know, when you work the land, when you disc it, when you're hoeing it, when you're doing all those things, you're breaking up the topsoil layer and that, that increases soil erosion that breaks down uh, the, the nutrient value of the soil. Well, you know, if you use Roundup, which is an herbicide, you can use that two or three times a year. Um, it breaks down within a week. Um, the constituent parts aren't as great as they were originally supposed to be. Um, and then if you thought, I mean, that's a, that's a net gain. You don't have to have you don't have to have, to have field workers out there uh, hoeing the, hoeing the fields. Or you don't have to have tractors going through and, and breaking up the topsoil and disking it all under. Um, the downside of it is, of course, that you know that, that, that all of a sudden all we've, we've got all of these Roundup ready uh, crops. Uh, they're, they're not Mont Monsanto isn't interested in developing uh, peaches that will taste better. You know they're interested in developing soybeans that will increase the sales of Roundup. And now we're getting into a kind of the, the, the icky situation of, you know, just as bacteria become um, uh, antibiotic resistant, we're, we're developing weeds that are Roundup resistant. And so, you know, and so, oh, oh, wait a minute, we're going to have to add this to the Roundup. We're going to have so, uh, you know. It, no, it is tough. And, and, uh, as but there's we, benefits. There, there are there benefits. potential benefits. There are infinite benefits, and particularly if you look at uh, places like Africa, it's, it's not clear that we will ever be able to Africa, or that they could feed themselves unless there are really advances in agriculture, probably many of which would have to come from GMO. Golden rice. Yes. I mean, there's, there's, right. a, there's, a, there's a rice grain that's close to development that would, that would, uh, that would dramatically de decrease the, the vitamin A uh, deficiency in Africa. And it would mean, you know, it would mean all of these kids not having eyesight problems and growing up healthier. What's a GMO? I mean, Sounds really awful, but that's a tough choice to make. Yeah. And, and maybe, maybe we shouldn't be making that choice for other people. For other people. Right. In, in your 20 years plus uh, of being a, a food writer and analyst, are we moving on a trajectory towards greater sustainability in, in the ways that we grow our harvest our foods? Oh, absolutely. I, I have absolutely no question about that. I've been going out, <coughs> I've been visiting farms for 20 years and. 
25 years talking to farmers and, uh, about how they grow things, and the, 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 the difference between 25 years ago and now is really dramatic. I mean, if you drive up, the, drive up Highway 99, and you'll see, there, I mean, there's, all, there, there's plenty, there's, there's still plenty, plenty of faults in California Act. But if you, when you drive up Highway 99, pay attention, look around. In the fields, you'll see birdhouses. Uh, IPM was the big thing about, uh, I'm sorry, it, it, it's called integrated pest management. Uh, it was a big thing about 15 years ago, and it's now completely mainstream. And what that means is, is that um, uh, they actually plant a, a specific mix of weeds between the crops, between the, the rows of the crops, because those weeds attract specific insects which eat the damaging insects, which dramatically de uh, decreases the pesticide load. Uh, there's all of this, you know, the, the things that the, that the organic movement introdu introduced, the ideas that the organic movement introduced are now becoming more and more mainstream. It used to be, you know, it's like, oh yeah, we're gonna get bugs to eat bugs, you know. And now, now that's just, it's a commonly held idea. It's, everybody's doing it. So if, if you were had total control, total power, that's a really scary thought. In California to transform the California agricultural economy into one that would be really sustainable, helpful, all of those, what would be your five point program? Five point program. Or you can have ten points if you need that. Number one would be to increase the, the potential for direct marketing. I think you know the state has the state licenses or they certify farmers markets, but they don't do anything beyond that, or they don't they don't they're not actively involved in in promoting anything beyond that. I think uh, increasing the opportunities for direct marketing would make a huge difference. I think um, I think uh, some kind of a subsidy for farms that were less you know, arbitrary number farms that were less than 75 acres. Um, it's an interesting thing where you, when you're in areas where there are smaller farms, uh, and smaller farms usually go hand in hand with higher value crops. Uh, but we, so, so like you know, a, like a five-acre strawberry field is huge. Uh, Two hundred-acre almond crop is small, you know. But when you're in, in areas where there are smaller farms, there's a different community spirit. There's not a, there's not a radical difference between the people who own the land. And the people who were who were just working there. It's the difference between Bakersfield and Visalia. Um, I would um, I would subsidize the introduction of drip irrigation and the implementation of new equipment um, to allow small farmers to take advantage of some of those some of the kind of space age um, um, uh, technologies that we were talking about earlier satellite imaging so they could find out you know where water was needed and when water was needed so that you're delivering water at exactly the it or delivering water and fertilizer <coughs> and, uh, at exactly the point the plant needs it and no more than the plant needs i mean that just seems uh, it, it, it would be uh, it would be an investment to begin with but it seems like the payoff down the road would be almost immediate it would be uh, it, would, it would solve so many of our problems now you have total power in that. But I was hoping you were I'd agree with all those. But that, what about doing something proper pricing of water? Oh, doing what? Pr proper pricing of water. When the water itself has a value greater than the crops you grow, like alfalfa, does that make sense in a sustainable world? Even if I was king, I don't think I'd be brave enough to get in the water. <laughs> You know, you get into situations like North San Diego County. Uh, North San Diego County is a great agricultural area. Um, in order to, to keep it agricultural, because it's, I mean, it's a, it's a real part of the California spirit, in order to keep it agricultural, for a long time, uh, the water district in North San Diego, in the Valley Center area, which is where, I mean, it's really heavily citrus, lots of avocados, I mean, great, it's a beautiful growing area. Um, so they delivered subsidized water to farmers. In order to, if you, you know, they, they had all these kind of like hurdles that they had to, had to jump through, farm size. I mean, it was a pretty well thought out, uh, pretty well thought out program. Um, but there was also the hook in it was that if there was a water shortage, uh, they were going to be the first ones to get to get cut. And the last thing I saw, 
This is last month. Uh, they had killed over 4,700 avocado trees that have been cut down in North San Diego County. Because guess what? The water shortage came. And so all of a sudden, the water rates for those farmers are, are going up. And, uh, and what they do with avocado trees is they, they call it stumping. And they cut it off about shoulder high and then paint it, you know, they paint it white, which is really weird. You, you drive through an orchard area, it looks like you know, it looks like a federal cemetery or something like that. But what they're doing is it, it, it um, uh, the, for the first year and a half to two years, the tree takes up almost no water. And then it'll start to come back. And ideally, you know, the water shortage will have turned around in two or three years. And you can, you know, take the tree back and you can, you can get a crop on it. But, but that's the kind of thing that happens with, I mean, water is so complicated. And, you know, I'm not moving. I'm not willing to give up the water that I use at my house. You know, I, we, we, we've drastically reduced it, but I love living in California, and that drives up the price too. I, I love living here too. Um, so we, we're stumbling in the direction of sustainability. Is, is stumbling a good metaphor? You think? Is that too? I, 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 no, I love the, I, I love the two words out of that. I mean, I love the, thing, the idea of sustainability too, but the, the stumbling towards I think really sums up the whole thing. Because, I mean, I guarantee you there are things that I believed five years ago that I know aren't true now. And that I may find out in five years are true. Uh, but it's a, it, it, this is an evolving science. I mean, it, it, we're still stumbling. You know, science is an argument. Science is a discovery. Science is one side saying this, and the other side coming back and saying, well, what about this? And the other side answering it. And it, it it's just, eventually, you, you reach, hopefully, there will be something of consensus. But we're still at our infant stage of it, I think, as far as sustainable, the science of sustainability. And the other thing I love is the word poor, because I don't think that the, I don't think sustainability is ever, ever something that we can be, unless we're you know unless we're living on you know on the riverbanks of the Los Angeles River and catching mullet and, and eating wild plants. We're going to be putting there's going to be an ecological impact of us living here. The thing is minimizing it. And so, if, if, if you, it's, it's almost like being on one of those crash diets. You know, if your if your idea is, you know, I'm gonna I'm going to eat nothing but grapefruit for the next month, and I'll get to this ideal weight. Well, that's not something that you can live with. You know, you, I mean, maybe literally, but um, it, it's it's not a sustainable plan. The the plan of I'm going to do something better every day. I'm going to and eventually I'm. I'm going to make a difference. I think that's something we can all live with. And, and I, I would agree. And I, it's sustainability. It, it's an elusive goal, but it, it, the general direction is like it's a direction, it's not a place. It's a direction. And uh, I, I think when um, yeah, on the Mississippi River, when the, the boats they would want to go from the uh, upper Mississippi down to New Orleans, but but they didn't get there by following the, the axis of the river. They used what was called point-to-point -point navigation. They would go from one point on one side of the river and they would head for another because they never knew what the currents were going to be like and what the visibility would be like. And I, I, I think that's what why is going to be kind of point-to-point. -point. All right, now we have some time and uh, for our questions from all of you. So what do you want to know? We, you could ask him, uh, he, he writes a lot about Ask him if he's a good cook. <laughs> <laughs> Who has a question? A bell? You said there's about five things at least that you have learned now that are not true, but you thought were true some time ago. Did oh, no, I said, I said there were things that I knew were true five years ago that I don't think are true now. Okay. Um, what do you want? You know, I, I would say, um, I would say probably GMOs is one. Um, you know, it's, it's a little bit like this, we were talking at dinner, but the Stuart Brand and, 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 and nuclear power. I was very, very strongly against it, but there's flaws with it that are really scary and that I have real problems with. But the potential is really amazing. I, I would really, I wouldn't be quite so dogmatic about rejecting it out of hand. Which is not the same thing as rushing towards it with open arms either. <laughs> <laughs> Who has the next question? Yes, go ahead. You talked about um, the farmer and their crops are basically you know, pooled mm -hmm. and then sold to the, to the larger. It, is, is there any um, quality control there that says, Farmer A and Farmer C have to, they all have to grow it the same way, or no. they, there isn't? No, there's, uh, I mean, there are, there's, there's what they call 
incorporated, mm -hmm. uh, but those are basically cosmetics. So that so the, um, they size things out so that the features are. If they say it's a, if it's you know 36 rows to a k to a bushel, well you know that, I mean they're going to be very accurately sized. They're going to be at roughly the same stage of brightness, but the quality that, that brightness is physiological. It has nothing to do with quality. I mean, a, 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 a really bad, a really badly grown peach will ripen. Um, it just won't ripen into anything that we really care to eat. So that's why when I buy six peaches, three can be great, three can be awful. That could be one. That that could well be one reason. Yeah. Now they, the farmer has no mechanism of selling direct. Farmers market. market. Yeah, I, no, I understand that, but I'm saying to, <laughs> to say um, a Trader Joe's or a Bristol Farms or the, a, Some of that is beginning to happen, uh, particularly with Whole Foods. Um, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's often referred to Whole Paycheck. Um, but, you know, they do, they're, they're, they're doing some good stuff. And one of the things that they've done is they, they, uh, they've invested a lot of money in teaching local farmers how to approach the stores because that's a huge barrier because it, for both the farmers and for the store managers. Um, California agriculture and fruit and vegetable agriculture in general was built since the turn of the century with the idea of supplying supermarket chains uh, and supermarket chains all over the country. And so those take huge amounts of anyone's fruit. Um, it's not something that one farmer could do. Um, and, and so what, what, what Whole Foods is doing is turning not only their managers being a, a little bit more open-minded toward the, 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 having farmers deliver, but training farmers, here's what the produce manager needs, that, you know, here, here's how they need you to, to do this. If you could ask our next two speakers uh, the, same, the same question about where seafood comes from, and you can have fish from a well-managed stock uh, is being mingled at the dock with fish from a poorly managed stock or, or different farms. It's the same problem. Uh, the chain of custody is very hard to follow in these situations. Another question. Who, Bob? A little off topic, but that's why you see the big agricultural cooperatives next to railroad tracks. They don't take them to farmers' markets. They load them on trains and take them across the country. But yeah, like, there, there's a whole, I mean, that, that's a whole interesting story about kind of the intertwining of the, of the railroad history and agriculture in California <laughs> and the cooperative movement. And the, and the cooperative movement and the, and the uh, proposition movement, which was basically developed to, to, to try and fight the power of the railroads. Yeah, I have a question about water, though. I, I was aware that uh, uh, farming uses about 80% of the, of the water. But I heard a statistic, and I don't know if it's true, about the amount of energy that's used to pump that water is a significant amount of our energy, too. That might include the water coming into urban areas, but to pump water around the state to get it into farmers' fields is the bulk of our energy, also. I mean, that's another I don't know what the statistics are on that. Yeah. I wonder what the alternatives would be. Well, I'm well not, not that you, you, you wouldn't need it to get the water there, but more efficiently than you'd lose that, that energy and do mm -hmm. that. Yeah, it, is the, it is one of the, the largest use of en uses of energy in the state of California, pumping water around. And we have this amazing infrastructure that, that we get over half of our water from Northern California. Pump it's got 70 pump. years old now. Pump, pump, yeah, that's right. Pump, and it, and it's an aging <laughs> infrastructure. Pump down, and, and it's very heavily subsidized, but the cost of that energy is more than it would cost in or as equal to the, the cost of doing ocean desalination done offshore. Yeah. And, and, uh, and everybody knows ocean desal is energy intensive, and it is. But we forget how much we're investing pumping water around. I want to come back with, with um, on the water theme also, because when we talk about these dead zones, Gulf of Mexico, Upper Chesapeake Bay, and so on, um, you look at these areas, uh, and you have major rivers, that drain lots of large agricultural areas. California, our, our largest rivers are the Sacramento and San Joaquin. We've taken 50% of the water out of those for agriculture and for urban urban use. And so we don't see that same kind of impact in our estuaries in California as you do in Chesapeake Bay or the Gulf of Mexico. And, and 
uh, so again, it's interesting how agriculture here in California has not had the same environmental impact as it has. In there are problems in the, in the, in the Delta. Uh, many there, problems. There are many problems, but they're not as bad as, I mean, nothing's as bad as the Justice Bay. But it's not as bad as it could be otherwise, because it's, it's, I mean, there are a lot of regulations that are in place. Um, farms are, are regulated by how closely they can, how close they can plant the water source. To, to, I mean, there's all kinds of things that, are, that have been, um, uh, all kinds of regulations that can minimize runoff, pesticide runoff, fungicide runoff, you know, herbicide runoff. I think we do a pretty good job on that. But the problem will be in, in the Delta is that it's mo most of it is 15 to 25 feet below sea level. The, the levees are, are old, they're earthen levees. An earthquake of magnitude seven or seven and a half, mm -hmm. they will liquefy. And we would, in Southern California, lose 50% of our water in three to four years minimum. Yeah. And uh, we, we, we don't seem to want to want to talk about that. Well, it's going to cost money. It's going to cost money, <laughs> that, that's true. But uh, we're, it, we're very vulnerable we have it. to that. I, yes, we, we do have to do that, I think. Kareem. It's kind of like when you find termites in your attic, you know, the first time you think, well, maybe next year. Correct. Uh, would you comment on the farmer's markets being the source of new products? Like the Freedom's Market is, uh, often has new things that get into the culture. Uh -huh. uh, we've got, no, we didn't know kiwi for a long time. And last big. year, Farmer's Market on the Marina had a new mang uh, mango. And this year, they thought it was Trader Joe's. Well, you, you know, if you go to the Santa, the, the, the kind of the, the, the queen market of Southern California Farmer's Markets is the Santa Monica market. And when you go there, you'll see representatives from all different kinds of produce distribution centers. Because that's where the exciting stuff's happening. And that's where, you know, I mean, that's where chefs find new products. That's where food writers start writing about them. Uh, and they want to be in on that at the same time. Uh, and in a lot of cases, um, uh, they're actually, the, the, the uh, produce distributors are buying from farmer's market farmers. Uh, and they're paying, they're paying table rates. So they're doing, a, I mean, it's a, it's a great thing that, that they're doing. Subsidi I mean, it's not subsidizing, but they're buying in huge enough lots. I mean, it's like a, the former said it's like, do I want to sell one tomato a hundred times or a hundred tomatoes once? Um, and they're buying, they're buying in, in, in these big lots and then they're shipping them out all over the country and, and to supermarkets here in Southern California. I was at Bristol Farms a couple of years ago and there was a clamshell of tomatoes from Tutti Frutti Farms, which is a really great high-end farmer's market farmer. So these are the kind of things that are they're working. You know, it's, progress is slow and it's stumbling, but so yeah, we're moving, in the, moving in the right direction. We have time for about one or two more. Hey, who would like to ask one? Now well, let's see if somebody else does first. Anybody else want to ask over, a question? Over here. Oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, one other thing I know you've been touching on, but it's, it's highly prevalent in the news, is food borne illness <clears throat> and, and how that relates to sustainability. You know, we had our spinach problem, uh, I think last year, the peanut butter disaster, and probably even getting started with it around beef, you know. Um, are we getting a, a handle on that? Because I think, you know, obviously you could, you, could, you could build up to a sustainable agricultural and everything else, but once you have a breakdown in the system like they did with the spinach, where, where do we go from there? And are we getting better at, at catching these things after these kind of uh, problems? Well, if you look, I, it, 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 I, I hate to keep saying it's complicated, <laughs> but it's complicated. I know. And, and the, 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 the uh, um, the, the big problem for the uh, salmonella and the spinach, I guess that was a year and a half ago now or two years ago. I mean, that's one of those things when they finally track it down, what had actually happened was that some wild pigs had broken through a fence and they tracked through, they'd gone, they tracked through a cattle pasture and then a mile and a half away had tracked through a, a, a spinach field. And that's where the salmonella came from. And what, what, what exaggerates that course, is, is mass agriculture, because if it was only one farmer in one field of spinach, well, you know, two people would have gotten sick. But what happens is that when they take it into the packaging, and this, is, this was earth packaging, I mean, it's a, it's a huge, huge operation. I mean, they wash, they wash spinach in, in a 500-pound load. And so if the water isn't chlorinated enough, as it was in this case, um, uh, that, that's 
salmonella can spread to all 500 to 500 pounds of spinach instead of just a couple of leaves. I think it makes it all, because it don't look then all there. Oh well, there's a you know there's an easy fix for that. We'll just do small. Well, the problem with so much of what we're talking about about changing agriculture is that, that there's a cost involved. Um, consider you know all of the things that are wrong with agriculture today. Uh, there are so many things that are right about it. And, and you know, one of the things that we completely take for granted is that in, in the 1940s, uh, the average family spent something like 24% of their household income on food. We spend about 12% today. Um, so when we start looking at, at going back to the good old days, we want to remember a little bit more of what the good old days were really like. At the turn of the century, you know, when, when, you know, which is what I, what I think, you know, a lot of people kind of think, oh, we'll, we'll go back to Farmer Jones and, you know, at the turn of the century, half of the American workforce was involved in agriculture. And, and food cost 40% of the average household income. And there were huge belts of the country because of distribution problems. There were huge belts of the, of the country where malnutrition was a chronic disease. You know, now we're in a situation where Obesity is the <laughs> So, you know, it's, it's like, you know, I, I hesitate to go too far down the Alice Waters route because what's going to happen when fruits and vegetables cost three times what they cost now? And they're out of the reach of the poor. I mean, I don't want to be responsible for that. Yeah. And we, maybe in the next one, we'll talk about farm salmon and the, <laughs> the cost of farm salmon. No, I, the scale does cause problems. You, you mentioned the spinach. When we have the, the recently, well, a couple of years ago, or so we had the, the problems with, with chickens uh, from, from China. You know, they grow these chickens, but the thousands and thousands in the multi-story buildings, and the floors of the buildings are fine wire mesh. And if you get an infected chicken in the penthouse, the, way, the droppings from that go all the way down to the chickens on the ground floor, and you can cause all of these chickens to be Mass, mass agriculture causes huge problems, but it also results in huge savings. Yes. I mean, that's... It's, it's, it's complicated. It's complicated. <laughs> the other thing that I've heard people suggest is, is, is you know, and, 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 a, and a real alternative is to go to something like irradiation of, of fruits and vegetables. Because you can guarantee that there's... I mean, we could stop foodborne illness tomorrow if we irradiated everything we ate. Uh, the problem with that, I mean, in addition to the whole... To, to the problems of what are you going to do with the spent rods and all of that kind of stuff. But the problem with that is that all of that stuff costs a lot of money for equipment. And getting that equipment is going to be completely out of the reach of small farmers. So if, in order to have a, a, a completely safe food supply, we're going to wipe out everybody who's, who's not a mega corporation and growing. That's not an exchange that I'm willing to make at this point. One last question. Anybody have? All right, Val, you can have the last one. Thank you. Younger ones <laughs> make it grow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, people always want to know what the best place in Long Beach is. <laughs> I always get under the impression that it would be safer to go to the supermarket where the the goods are controlled as they're coming in. But perhaps not. What about the farmer's market? You're, you're buying directly from the farmer, but how are we to know certification-wise that what they have is as as clean, or is it cleaner? I don't know. Um, you don't. You don't know. Um, it's it's a black box. I mean, with the with the uh, in, in both in both cases. I mean, most of the, in the what I would my argument would be that that the major cases of foodborne illness we've had uh, in the last 10 years or 15 years since farmer's markets began becoming incredibly popular, none of them have come from farmer's markets. Right. Uh, which either speaks to the fact that uh, people aren't reporting it, or that, that it, it's, a, it's we're, we're going back to that thing of it, it's only affecting so few, so few people that it's not getting reported as an outbreak. Um, but I, I don't know. You, you, that's just not something you can be sure of. You can be you can be relatively sure with the farmers market. The chain of custody is going to be way shorter than it is. Mm -hmm. You know, every time I mean, my theory is anyways that every time something changes hands, there's another opportunity for a problem. With the farmers market, 
uh, generally there's there's one exchange, the farmer to you. And certainly pressure. Certainly pressure. Uh, when you're talking about a supermarket, it could go from, it'll, typically it will have gone from the farmer to the packing shed, to a consolidator, to a distributor, to the supermarket warehouse, uh, to the supermarket, to you. So it's a lot more steps in between where something could have happened. <coughs> Which isn't to say that supermarket produce is dangerous or anything like that. It's, to, it, it, it's, 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 it's trying to answer a hard question. Yeah. It's complicated. It's complicated. It's, complicated. <laughs> <laughs> and it's sustainable. Right, thank you. This has been wonderful. Okay. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.
take a week, and instead of coming here on Wednesday, the last class will be Tuesday evening back in this room. So a week from next Tuesday. Okay. Um, and I will send an email, a follow-up email to everybody. Tuesday, May 18th. Okay. Okay. And that's when we're going to try to to put some of the, the pieces together and uh, see what we can conclude from the people we have heard from. It's nice to show. So, um, so under that definition of, of uh, by NOAA, 
obviously muscles are included. I'm just going to go through uh, some examples very quickly. Uh, muscles are in, uh, in oysters very common here on the West Coast, Canada, New Zealand, um, and, uh, and typically regarded as, as some of the more sustainable types of, of aquaculture uh, because there is a very little control over, over water quality, over feed inputs. They basically buy the seed, put them out there in the, in the water, and then let the, the little guys filter particulates out of the ocean. Um, sort of at the, at the other end of the spectrum, more contentious uh, type of farming, bluefin tuna. Now bluefin tuna, um, although it's, it's starting to be farmed in research areas around the world um, and starting to come into, into the marketplace, uh, most of the farm bluefin tuna out there is actually ranch. The, di the difference is that um, farming, uh, aquaculture farming operations actually produce fish from eggs, whereas ranching operations, in this case, the fishermen go out, they catch adult fish, bring them back, hold them, feed them whole bait fish until the fish are fat and the market is high, and then they sell them. Um, so, uh, so that's known as tuna ranching, where, um, where you are uh, not actually producing any more fish than what is, than is already produced by natural systems. So sort of a variation on that, uh, this is a, a company that collects wild post-larval fish um, there's a uh, funnel-shaped net with a lantern on top, and I have no idea why this thing works, but, uh, but you put it out in the ocean and the fish are attracted to the light first, this little microscopic post larval fish, and after being attracted to the light, they're attracted to the shadow of the dark funnel-shaped net underneath. You come back in the morning, the thing is full of fish. Um, so that the, the reason why they do this is because one of the, the more difficult stages to address in, in marine fish culture is metamorphosis, and that first feed after the yolk sac is gone. So when they collect uh, wild post larval fish, they skip that whole first feeding, they grow those fish up, and so they're sort of, uh, again, they're not producing any more fish than what, than what natural production is already producing. They're collecting more fish from the wild and highly dependent on wild stocks. Giant clams, these are probably, uh, in terms of animals, one of the most sustainable animals to, to grow ever, just because with the algae symbiote, they're, they're essentially solar powered. Uh, you don't give them any feed at all, and they're also uh, simultaneous hermaphrodites. But you can't actually self-fertilize them, but, uh, but you, you know, effectively double the, the number of food stock that our plants can have in there. And this particular facility was run entirely off of uh, solar wind power. So the poster, a little bit closer to home, this is a poster from Hub Sea World, which, if you're not familiar with that, is uh, a stock enhancement program here in California. Um, uh, in the 80s and uh, 70s and 80s, I guess we really decimated the, the white sea bass populations off of California. And so hubs grows these fish up to fingerling size, they hold them in pens very briefly, they're tagged, and then they're released. And this, this enhances uh, the, uh, the natural stock. So it's a stock enhancement program that enhances natural populations. And this is because fishing pressure was so great that, um, uh, that natural production couldn't keep up with it. So uh, hubs has released uh, well over a million fish since, since the 80s. And they, they have the capacity to produce definitely over a quarter of a million fish per year. That sounds like a lot of fish, but it's not, because in Alaska, um, hatcheries up there have stock enhancement programs that release just about 2 billion fish per year as fry. And you can see this hatchery alone since 1980 has released well over 60 million fish just by itself. So that completely dwarfs the stock enhancement program that we have here in California. Uh, again, to, uh, to enhance natural stocks, because fishing pressure in Alaska is so great, the natural production can't keep up. All right, this is a, a shot of uh, Kona Kampachi, which is uh, from a farm called Kona Blue in Hawaii. Marine uh, fin fish, open ocean farm. They're farming cages, uh, which is a uh, type of holding uh, facility that is uh, submersible as opposed to a net pen that's always at the surface and open on the top. So uh, very clean water, very high quality fish. But one of the interesting things about Kona Kampachi is that it's, it's an Almaco jack, and there is no uh, wild, uh, version of it in the marketplace. There's no wild fishery for it because the adults all have uh, parasites. And so if you eat an Alamco Jack, you didn't caught it yourself or it's going to caught you. Um, all right, so these on the end there are uh, purple sea urchins. I just threw this in totally gratuitously because this is what I worked on for graduate work. But uh, uh, they're a popular research animal because the entire genome has been sequenced and they're sort of a snapshot genetically of what uh, what uh, vertebrates look like before vertebrates really developed. They have all very, very similar genes. So here, uh, this one 
This one is just about to metamorphose. You can see they start off with this bilateral symmetry, and there's the urchin juvenile inside. And then this is uh, this one is just the one on top there is just metamorphosed, and you can see that it's developed radial symmetry with exactly five arms. Lastly, this is uh, an extensive algae farm in uh, in Hawaii again. Um, obviously, algae farming very glamorous. <laughs> All right. So an incredibly, incredibly diverse field, and uh, that doesn't represent you know half of, of, of what the field covers. Um, one way to view, to find a common thread between all of them, is to look at the um, the uh, varying levels of control over the common inputs. So this is an idea that was that was uh, put out by uh, Dr. James Anderson, no relation, at uh, University of Rhode Island, uh, who's an economist there in the, the uh, economics department. So he devised a five-point scale, looking at, uh, at different inputs, and I sort of paraphrase what, what he was talking about there, but uh, uh, to quantify uh, different levels of inputs. And on, the, on the, the far right side, with the highest score, with the, the most independence, uh, so to speak, from, from wild systems, would be the theoretical aquaculture, complete control facility, um, with complete control of the water quality, 100% uh, recirculation, complete control over genetics and brood stock, complete independence from wild bait, and therefore uh, the associated rights would be 100% from cradle to grave. At, at the other end, you would have a theoretical uh, uh, open access fishery that would be uh, uh, no control over, over any of the inputs, uh, complete dependence on wild stocks, complete dependence on wild feeds, and um, the associated rights would be uh, or zero right up until the point that the fisherman physically had possession of that fish. So um, from the examples in the previous slide, uh, I hope you can, you can, you can see that, that most aquaculture operations are going to end up somewhere in the, in the middle, that there's only partial control over, over uh, some of the inputs. They're going to end up with a sort of uh, middle score. And even uh, in terms of fisheries, with fisheries moving more towards uh, cooperative cooperative fishing uh, organizations uh, moving towards um, uh, uh, more elaborate permitting processes and transferable rights, um, as well as uh, dependence on, on stock enhancement programs, there, there really is no such thing as the, as the theoretical completely open access fishery either. That those are also moving towards the limit. So again, um, uh, we can see this as, well, we can see this as, as sort of this one continuum of, uh, of inputs and how uh, uh, really what we should be doing is, is looking at, at what inputs are appropriate for any given type of, of seafood production uh, system. All right, so I, I, I've had some examples here. I'm going to skip through. I'm actually, gonna, I'm going to skip through quite a few slides just to kind of keep us on track. Well, this one's interesting though. So the Aquarium of the Pacific, aquaculture operation or no? Yeah. Yes. Right. We hold the animals. Uh, we have uh, husbandry programs here. Um, now, I think this is an interesting example because I would think that from the outside, I would think that, that a public aquarium would come the closest to that theoretical maximum of aquaculture, the highest level of confinement, the highest level of, of uh, control. And in fact, when we look at it, we do have a high level of confinement, but we have only moderate level of, of, of uh, control over water inputs. We actually do exchange quite a bit of water here at the aquarium, and that's common for, for public aquariums across the country. Uh, we're very highly dependent on wild stocks, for our, for our fish, even though we do reproduce some here. We're very highly dependent on wild feeds, uh, which is appropriate for, uh, for an aquarium. Uh, and the rights, of course, are, are fairly uh, complete here. You can't just come in and, and grab sharks out of shark again. <laughs> All right, so is complete control over inputs desirable? Absolutely not. Um, and, and this is uh, part, of the, part of the message that, that really what we want to do is, is, is take things on a case-by-case -case basis almost and, and recognize when it's appropriate to depend on wild systems and when it's appropriate to depend on culture systems and be able to identify uh, the inputs and, and at this point be able to uh, devise ways to measure the efficiency so that we can, uh, we can come up with a more comprehensive system of, of uh, seafood production that's not just about wild fisheries versus aquaculture. Um, one of the, did I skip one there? All right, I'm gonna skip ahead to this one. Uh, one of the reasons why I threw this slide up here is because this quote recognizes the fact that, um, that there, there are issues in sustainability that are not unique to aquaculture. There are, there are things that, uh, um, that are applicable to all human endeavors. 
So anything that uses, or really anything that, that humans do, any, any human industry uses energy, produces waste, and, and therefore uh, you know, has to contend with the wise use of natural resources. So that is, uh, that is the, the point that this, that this uh, person is making, <coughs> uh, research into uh, fish health and the benefits of, uh, of eating fish. So some of the things that, um, the, the, the three pillars really of sustainability are uh, environmental, social, political, and economic. And if any one of those is missing, then, and this is, this is applying to, to all, and, and sustainability in a greater sense. If any one of those is missing, then we don't have sustainability. This is something that we're very mindful of in our program, because obviously if we make recommendations to a restaurant based on solely uh, environmental data, and that restaurant goes out of business, clearly that wasn't sustainable. Um, so uh, so all, there are uh, economic uh, uh, aspects, and especially uh, when we consider the cost of enforcement for fisheries, uh, subsidizing uh, farmers, subsidizing uh, fishermen, excuse me, and, and costs sometimes of, of taking uh, fishermen and, and re-educating them to, uh, to do other things once the fishery is closed. Um, so all these things have to be taken into account. There, there are definitely <coughs> aspects that are unique to aquaculture, and um, it's difficult to say what those are. And I hope that I can press upon you that the reason why it's difficult is because the field is so broad. We can't talk about generalities for the field of aquaculture because we're talking about you know the farming of algae on one end, the farming of bluefin tuna on the other, and everything in between. And so uh, trying to come up with exactly what uh, what sustainability means for the entire field is virtually impossible. What we want to do is take things on a case by case basis. So instead of doing that, what I've chosen are several topics that you sort of hear all the time in popular literature, um, in uh, uh, I guess commonly discussed forums. Um, such as this. Uh, so feeds, the use of bait fish, uh, uh, the associated waste management, uh, escaped fish, uh, chemical pollution, and disease transmission risk. So starting with feeds, um, one of the things we find is that uh, uh, the public level of, 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 of scientific understanding lags behind uh, uh, scientific research. And so this is the one case where it, it, the um, uh, the quote of five pounds of bait fish to make one pound of farm salmon has been repeated. I'm sure that, that you've all heard it in, in one place or another. So what that comes from is a series of papers by two researchers, um, and that was picked up in turn by Stanford University, who were very critical of aquaculture, and it was put into the Pew Edger Report, which uh, 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 the um, researchers from, from Stanford wrote. Um, and so it was repeated very often, and even today you can hear uh, Ted Danson after the end of the blind movie and when he's when being interviewed talk about this, this quote, five pounds of bait fish and one pound of salmon. So there was a, another researcher more, more recently who realized uh, that there was an error in the original calculations. And what the original guys had done was uh, to take every single species uh, that, was, that was commonly farmed, so shrimp, salmon, and so on, and to add up uh, the, uh, the number of bait fish that was used, the ratio for each one, and total it up. And what, he, what uh, Dr. Jackson realized was that the totals exceeded what we produce in bait fish globally. Like, we just don't have that many fish. So there had to be an error somewhere in the calculations. And he took a reverse approach and uh, used a, a mass balance approach <coughs> to divide exactly where the fish were going and uh, realized the mistake was that uh, they, they did not, the original researchers did not assume that there is no waste in fish meal and fish oil production, that all that stuff goes somewhere. So every time that the original researchers um, calculated it, they, they accounted for a certain amount of waste. Well, there is no waste. It all goes somewhere. So uh, recalculating it, the correct ratio, according to Dr. Jackson, is 1.68 pounds of bay fish to uh, one pound of salmon. So, uh, next question, is this a net loss in protein? Uh, yes, absolutely it is. But uh, the second part of this argument is that the correct, the correct comparison is not to nothing, because every, every organism in the world, all organotrophs that, uh, that get energy and carbon from eating something else, uh, you know, uh, there's, there's a certain amount of loss involved in that. It's because we use it uh, in energy, we use it, there's heat loss, uh, there's waste just of eating and so on. So in nature, um, that loss is, does anybody know what that, what that trophic uh, transfer is? 90% is the loss. That's the amount of, of material, of, of biomass that's lost between trophic levels. So 10% is transferred. 10% of the 
massive grass is transferred to the cow, 10% of that cow is transferred to you and a, and a hamburger, and so on, for every single system out there, on average. Um, and so what I'm showing here is the correct comparison between natural <coughs> systems in which it takes uh, 100 pounds of wild bait fish to create one, or sorry, 100 pounds of wild bait fish to create one 10 pound wild salmon versus on a farm, 16.8 pounds of wild fish to create one 10 pound farm salmon. So the reason why it's so much more efficient on farms is because, again, going back to the, to the waste and why there's waste, um, think about on the farm how the fish do not spend any energy hunting for food. They're eating a diet that's specifically formulated for them, and the feed is exactly bite sized so there's no waste uh, while they're eating. Um, and of course, you know that, that diet is maximized uh, for for weight gain. All right, so I did uh, another example for for marine fish, and this is really only to show that when you skip trophic level, when you when you farm those higher trophic levels, you get uh, you you gain a factor of 10 in efficiency by skipping that trophic level. But really, um, I think what, what I want to get at here um, is that the, the feeding efficiency is the basis of a lot of other problems or a lot of other, other issues, potentially, in aquaculture. And if you're using less feed, then you're producing less waste. And if you're producing less waste, then you have uh, higher water quality. If you have higher water quality, you have fewer disease issues. If you have disease issues, you're using fewer chemicals to treat with. So it all starts with, with feed efficiency. And not only that, but uh, in comparing to, to wild fish, I mean, thinking about how decimated our, our wild fisheries are, what we're doing by farming fish at these levels is leaving bait fish in the ocean to act as bait fish, to, to, uh, to be productive in the ecosystem and, uh, and function as fish. All right, let's see if I can get back on track here. All right, so uh, water quality. This is a picture of the, uh, the farm in, in Kona, um, and you can see that the, this is completely undoctored. You can, you can see that the, the water quality is very high in terms of uh, suspended particulates, and you can also see that the stocking density is low enough with this, with this uh, net that you can actually see right through that, that school of fish. Uh, and that is the, um, the whole idea behind open ocean aquaculture. So there's very low control over, over the water quality, but you're taking advantage of the fact that that resource is abundant. This is a picture of uh, the other farm in Hawaii that uses the same type of cage as you saw on the previous slide. But this is a farm that, uh, that, that uh, farms Pacific Threadfin in a much shallower location. And so um, you can see that the water quality there is so high that there's actually coral growing on top of that. These nets are never brought to the surface. Uh, this farmer leaves them, leaves them on the bottom all the time. The nets are cleaned uh, naturally with, uh, with sea urchins. And, uh, and so that gives a you know a chance for all kinds of things to, to grow on the, on the top in terms of uh, the corals. But obviously corals, you know, reefs are very um, efficient in terms of uh, recycling nitrogen. So if there were nitrogenous waste in this area, these corals would be outcompeted by by algae. They would not be able to grow. That's uh, certainly not to that size. I and mean, that is it's not a large platform there. It's a very large corals. Um, Actually, uh, as this goes on, I kind of uh, get higher and higher on the, on the soapbox. So I'm going to skip over some of these slides. Um, but if there's anything that, that people want to discuss later on, I'd be, I'd be happy to go over any, any one of these points. Um, I, I did want to uh, make a note that, um, uh, that the, 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 NOAA, the NOAA policy that's being created right now, they're, uh, they have listening sessions and they're taking comments. And one of the call-in sessions is, is uh, tomorrow. So if you feel so inclined to, uh, to make comments, then I encourage you to do so. And you can also uh, submit them online. Um, so I think that, uh, that what I'm trying to get across is, is, is that you know, this, in this incredibly diverse field, uh, what we need to look at is, is uh, a way to encourage the, uh, the, the, the recognition, how to define exactly what these inputs, inputs should be, and then we should go about measuring them. And, and one of the ways that, the, pretty much the only way we're going to be able to do this is to launch the industry here in the U.S. Is to be able to encourage the industry to get the permitting process through, to encourage this policy that's going through NOAA, and to uh, to encourage an industry in which we can measure those inputs and, and come up with a uh, with, with a viable 
sustainable policy that works for the U.S. Because what we've been doing over the past few years is discussing whether or not we need aquaculture. And in the meantime, the other countries uh, who don't have this sort of debate going on have created an industry that now satisfies our demand. All right, so the last thing I want to end with is uh, we did a, uh, a fish identification project earlier this year based on uh, DNA barcoding techniques for fish. And uh, I don't want to go through the, the results right now, but one of the things I wanted to point out is that we had, so we took 40 samples from restaurants and distributors in our program. 12 of those 40 samples were, were found to be substituted, but six of those, of those substitutions we suspect are farm species that are masquerading as wild fish. And these are things that you, know, you would not be able to tell without the molecular techniques to identify these fish. And so what we think, even though this is a very small study, this is not you know, uh, extremely significant, but uh, half of the substitution being suspected as farm products, uh, you know, we think that that is indicative of the fact that there are probably a lot more farm products in the U.S. than any of the, the statistics that are currently out there show. All right, that's all I got. Thanks. Well, I uh, stumble here with my computer, my PowerPoint presentation. I should probably be very honest in letting everyone know that I had the majority of it on my hand, but I, I washed it off about 15 minutes ago, so this could, this could be a problem. Um, Okay, excellent. Well, my name is Andrew, just in case anyone wants to yell at me as I'm in the midst of this presentation for other things I can dodge very quickly. But I just want to start actually by asking everyone right off the bat, I'm, I'm going to get there, I'm going to get right into the good stuff in case anyone wants to walk out before the end. But when I say farm seafood, what, what's the impression, good or bad? I mean, and let's, let's just throw it out there. Just without, independent of anything that we've heard, good or bad, we're at a restaurant, farm seafood. Bad. Bad? Bad? Okay. Okay. Well, it's interesting because I'm going, to, I'm going to state first and foremost that in response to the question, kind of leading in the thesis of this is that can aquaculture supplement our loss of wild fish stocks or is aquaculture part of the future in terms of sustainability, food production, food systems? I'm just going to straight up and say not only is it part of the future, it's our, we're already there. That This conversation, we actually are wasting everybody's time by having this conversation right now, number one. Number two, properly guided, the explosion in fish farming over the past 10 years is actually probably one of the most optimistic things that I've seen for food systems in general. In relation, in relation to you know, uh, the farming of cattle, pigs, chickens, and so on. So what I did was, when I, when I first, you know, we put this together and when we put the whole program together about a year ago, one of, one of the things we did is we went out and we asked consumers, we asked chefs, you know, what's your percep perception of fish farming? You know, what do you think when you hear the word fish farming. So in a style of kind of psychology, I, I had people actually draw some pictures for me of what their perception of fish farming was. So I want to run through a couple of these. Um, this is the first one that, that somebody drew for me. This, this was their idea on fish farming right here. And uh, I thought this was actually really interesting because this is what I always thought it was as well. Uh, the, next one is, the next one is great. And this is, this is local. <laughs> but, um, this, once again, you know, a form of fish farming, but that, is this what's actually happening? Is this what we're eating? And then, you know, third, thirdly, and, and this, is, this, is, this I think is probably the closest to the truth, we have, um, you know, the, the fish right here for the farm. Now, I want to really kind of tap into that because I want to show you some numbers that actually prove really the fact that we are eating 
the majority of the fish that we consume in the United States are farmed already. And just the, the, uh, the report that Dave was quoting from Anderson, not himself, the other Anderson, was that, and in the beginning of that report, he kind of painted a very interesting scenario in which he said that there was, it was like the early 1900s, and there was a, a community, and it was the town meeting, and they were talking about, um, you know, the horse and carriage and where the rest of the menorah is going to go. And as they're having this meeting, uh, you know, a T-bird drives by. And they, they, they look out the window and these cars start to drive by, but they continue having the conversation about the horse and the carriage and the disposal of the manure, not recognizing that that, it, that that conversation no longer needs to be had. We've moved forward. Everybody else has moved forward, specifically consumers at this point. So as I talk to people and I tell them that we've already consumed, I want to just talk a few stats here on aquaculture. I won't go through all of them. But I think number one, one of the most important ones is that 81% of the seafood consumed in the U.S. is imported, and 40% of those imports are farmed. Um, you know, 70% of this is produced in China, 22% in the rest of Asia, and 1.3% of it is farmed in North America. This is, this is always, I always love these. I just like to see the lines go up and down. I don't necessarily read the graphs too specifically. But world aquaculture production right here between 1950 and 2006, if you look at this, I mean, amazing, 60, over 60 million tons of aquaculture, and where it's just kind of skyrocketed post-1990. What's interesting is, is that completely correlates with the uh, reported decline in wild fish stocks. So you ask yourself, okay, well then, if we didn't have all of those products that we're eating, all of those aquaculture products, what, where would that have come from? Would that have come from wild stocks, or would we have just not eaten seafood in general? And the interesting thing about that is, is that seafood is one of the most inexpensive, relatively, um, you know, eco-friendly, and I say that in quotes because eco-friendly relative to farming of cattle, the farming of pigs, and so on and so forth, looking at that cost-benefit that can feed millions and millions of people worldwide. So we would have then also had to face the economic sustainability issues of the fact that there would have been people starving and they wouldn't have been able to afford having a high-quality, incredibly healthy protein had we not provided that by virtue of this aquaculture that we're pointing out right here. So nine billion is the United States annual seafood trade deficit, which is the second largest trade deficit for a natural resource behind oil. So now we're talking some of the, you know, the economics here, the economic sustainability. And that the total US aquaculture production is 1.2 billion annually, compared to a world production of 70 billion. And um, you know, another quote down here. So, so these numbers are, to me, somebody who's, as, as, we've, as you heard through my bio, I'm not, a, I'm not a marine biologist. I look at everything based on profit, bottom line, and ultimately food. That's really what it comes down to. So I look at these numbers, and it's just astronomical the fact that we're so far behind right now. And I ask and I say, are we behind right now because of the fact that there's this regulatory framework that's in the way, or a lack thereof? Are we behind because we continue to have these conversations as we all talk about aquaculture is a bad thing, but we don't recognize that we're already eating farmed species of seafood? And it's, it's amazing right here. More truth about the seafood is that 51% of the seafood consumed in the world was farmed in 2008. So we, we're, we've already peaked. We've gone above it. 51% of the seafood. Shrimp is the number one consumed species in the U.S., and salmon is the second most consumed species in the U.S. So when you look at shrimp and salmon, oh, we got to freeze here. Well, well uh, what, what was missed there is, is that uh, you look at how much the spike has gone up in terms of shrimp and salmon. So we're consuming shrimp and we're consuming salmon, and the majority of the production of both shrimp and salmon in the world is farmed. So indirectly, what we're eating as the number one and two consumed species in the United States as consumers is farmed seafood. So the public perception. In general, consumers feel as if farmed is a forbidden word, as we see right now, just by me asking everybody in the crowd. And this is, is what we could consider to be an educated audience, just based on the fact that we're here on a Wednesday night at the aquarium, listening to me, you know, rant and rave about this, but more importantly, learning about, you know, the seafood systems and so on. Eight out of ten chefs interviewed in Southern California, we personally interviewed them, so I don't want to, I want to at least let you all know that this information can be somewhat skewed, but eight out of ten chefs interviewed in Southern California believe that farm seafood is a bad thing. And when asked if they would prefer wild or farm seafood, nine out of ten consumers say wild is better. When we started the program, we went around and we asked chefs. We, we kind of sit there and we play, you know, a little bit of investigative journalism in this, and, and we main, main as much objectivity as possible and just asking, what's your idea of sustainability? What is it? And the majority of chefs are like, oh, it's all wild seafood is sustainable. Are you okay? They're, it's wild. That's what sustainable is. And then when we say to them, well, actually, in actuality, you know, farm seafood is also very sustainable. They're like, yeah, no, actually, seriously, most of what we order is farmed. So there's this, there's this, this, this kind of um, 
you know, it's deception that's going on right now, and that's the truth. And I know this personally. When I was working at uh, a, two large seafood operations in New Jersey along the coast there, seafood New Jersey, I know where the jokes are going to go on this, <laughs> but I was working at, and uh, it, it was when the statistics came out about three years ago that the uh, in California the wild salmon season had actually been halted from a commercial perspective, and that we weren't importing the wild seafood because the stocks weren't out there, and most the majority of it was coming from Alaska. So granted, we weren't buying seafood from California. By virtue of this information, I said, you know what? Let's make a stand here and at least say, let's try and all take some of the pressure off of salmon and serve another species that had, is high in omega-3s but is environmentally friendly. And immediately, my mind starts to think Arctic char. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Arctic char, but it's actually it's, it's a farm species. It's almost like a mix between a trout and a salmon. That's, it's farmed in a closed containment system, a lot of controls, aside from the feed, which is one of the arguments against it, which I'm hoping here that my colleague Dave has already disbanded that idea that feed, the feed conversion ratio is a positive thing now, is that it's, it's, it's actually a very eco-friendly fish. So I said to the owners, I said, we want to switch to Arctic char, and I started explaining them how it's farmed. They're like, no, we can't do that. We have to, let's lie and say that it's wild sea trout. And, and they start, we get into this long debate, hence the reason that I'm here and I no longer work there, but we get into this, we get into this long debate about you know the fact that we can't. Ultimately, it, it got to the point where I actually had to go out and speak with essentially every table just to get them to try it, disbanding the fact that the farm, it, the farm wasn't bad, which then later covered up, or actually unveiled, that all of the seafood that this restaurant was serving year-round in order to make their amazing bottom line was farm seafood that they were claiming was wild. Because the truth of the matter is, is that we cannot consume wild salmon year-round. We can only consume it for a couple months of the year. So, that's, you know, something, so it's all about this public perception. So we think and we say that farm seafood is bad, not recognizing that what we're eating is farm seafood. There was, um, let's see if we switch here. There was a study that was done, and, well, I asked a couple questions here, of course. Uh, is this farm? And when we just kind of look at these basic species, we don't necessarily know. You know, the next picture is, is a piece of salmon. Is this farm? You know, we don't know. And the, the, the fact of the matter is that of 80% of seafood that's consumed in the United States has done so in a restaurant setting. Now those numbers have fluctuated a little bit over the years between 71% and 80%, but in general, all the seafood we consume, we consume in a restaurant setting. So we're really leaving it up to the chefs to let us know whether these species are farmed or wild. And yet, the chefs don't necessarily have those regulations. Restaurants don't have the regulations in place to say you have to, to, you have to actually label this properly. Now, retail operations in both Europe and the United States, it's a law that you actually have to label whether the species is wild or farmed. But how much is that actually enforced and observed? I was in a seafood market in downtown LA a couple weeks ago, and I was trying to find some sardines, because uh, we cook uh, breakfast for Jerry every day, and it's usually sardines. And I was, trying to find, I was trying to find some sardines, and as I'm looking around the seafood market, all of the seafood is labeled uh, farmed U.S. seafood. And I'm looking, I'm thinking, okay, tuna? Shrimp? It was like they were printing off these labels right there. There was no, it, there was no possible way that all of that shrimp was farmed in the U.S. We, the three U.S. farms that are commercial, we talk to on a regular basis. So what was really interesting is, is that it's just kind of, oh, well, let's just slap this label on it. And the same thing happens on a restaurant menu. Let's just put this label on there and say that it's wild. But what we're doing by not having this conversation is, is that we're, we're, we're kind of, continuing forward as the rest of the world moves forward without us from an aquaculture perspective. So instead of accepting the fact that aquaculture is not just the future, it's now, and that over 50% of the seafood that we're consuming, when we go out to eat it at restaurants, or even possibly in a retail setting, is already farmed, we haven't accepted the fact that now we need to do so in a responsible manner. And we need to take, you know, really kind of take the, the bull by the horns and say, look, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to utilize these amazing resources we have in the United States from both a scientific and an economic and a governmental perspective. And we're going to be able to show the rest of the world how to farm responsibly. I was just reading uh, this morning about a, a procedure. It's called uh, um, Integrated Multitrophic Aquaculture, IMTA. And it's this farming pro procedure in which you're, you're growing, you're, you're farming salmon. And in the salmon waste is actually then feeding this, this form of algae and pardon my, uh, my ignorance if I'm just kind of speaking from a very third grade perspective scientifically, this algae and then the, re the release of the rest of the, um, you know, whatever type of waste there is in the water is being filtered by these mussels, which are in these other huge pans. It's actually called Cooks is the name of the company that's farming off the coast of Canada and doing this. And it's a brilliant system that's so efficient. 
But what part of the paper that I was reading was talking about is, is that by virtue of our rejection of aquaculture in general, they can't market their products the way that they should. They can't market them properly. And then they're ultimately going to go under this e economic sustainability. And then we're going to go back to places like China that aren't regulated. And we're going to buy our seafood from China. We're going to buy our seafood from Vietnam. The restaurants are going to buy it. And the restaurants are going to sell it as wild US seafood. So there's a couple of things that can happen here and a couple of things that t can take place. Um, these are really interesting facts as well. The FDA recently determined that 37% of fish and 13% of other seafood was mislabeled. Uh, test, and this, this was a study which I found to be very interesting. There's a, a test performed by the New York Times in 2005 on salmon sold as wild by eight New York City stores going for as much as $29 a pound. And it showed that the fish at six of the eight retail operations it, were, were farmed when they were claiming that it was wild. So it really just shows that it's just this whole system of deception going on while we, while we kind of continue to have these conversations. We're almost pulling a blanket over our own eyes as consumers in the United States. The, um, you know, so I, I, I talk about a, a restaurant's influencing, influence here. And it kind of really it is about the, these restaurants and the control that we can have as consumers. And, and, and I hate to use this cliche, but it's so true. It's voting with our fork. And by continuing pressure on government to get this, the regulations necessary in order to be able to farm on the, you know, and, and kind of this open ocean aquaculture, we can at least just get some, some of the regulatory pressure on the labeling process here. So I try and predict the future. And um, you know, starting with restaurants, we can obviously have these simple, um, simple regulations that go along with what the US and both Europe have done from a retail perspective, labeling seafood as, as farm or wild. And then I go on, this is, these are some of my own personal predictions. I'm going to make bold predictions. Number one, catfish is going to be renamed Chilean cat bass. <laughs> and the U.S. is going to take over the worldwide seafood production farming catfish, as was done Chilean sea bass. You know, look at what happened from Patagonia toothfish. And just by virtue of this, this word bass, I think it takes it all over. We were talking the, the, the sap, this evening for dinner, and we said that sardines is going to be petite bass. And the next thing you know, <laughs> next thing you know, McDonald's is going to be begin selling sardines. So that's my second prediction. If these all don't get true, uh, I'm not giving my personal phone number on this. Anyone's going to be speculating or going long. The U.S. is going to take over in terms of redesigning fish farms to support the cultivation of several species. Talking about this, this in integrated multi-trophic aquaculture, I genuinely do envision that happening because what I see is a trend behind the scenes with chefs and restaurateurs. And what I see is a trend that encourages economic sustainability because chefs' bottom lines and restaurants' bottom lines, and, and I'm not just speaking specifically in terms of kind of the little mom and pop restaurant around the corner. I'm speaking large, the Dardens, the food service operation, the Aramarks, more specifically here for the Aquarium Saber. SMG is one of the largest institutional food service providers in the world, and we have the opportunity to work closely with them to really encourage a sustainable seafood sourcing policy. Support of government policies and a shift in consumer taste will lead to <clears throat> lead US in a better direction. And by that taste, I mean that consumer taste is eating a little bit lower on, on the trophic scale. I mean, it's funny, tuna was considered horse food about 80 years ago. And now tuna, by virtue of the fact that we've pretty much over, overfished it and overeaten it, is virtually extinct. So these trends, these consumer trends are important. The next stage of fish farming and open, is uh, you know fish farming open ocean aquaculture, and this I think this is a little sketch I put together. This is the, the fish farm I'm thinking that's going to go right off the coast here in Long Beach. And uh, if anybody wants wants me to email you a picture of this, I can I can certainly do so. We're still working on the specifications with seafood for the future. Now I, I, it's all come full circle. So that's thank you very much.
But some of the fish that I understand is coming from some of the Asian countries yeah. is not farmed very, very well. That's a very good yeah. point. So we're going to kind of pull up kind of all these together. What, what? In the marketing in the restaurants, you get truth and venue presentation. I get the feeling that the restaurants don't look back at the regulators. They look sideways at each other. And as they kind of, one steps out and does a little, this one will too, you see we're getting to a tipping point where they'll say, hey, let's be guilt free and just label it the way it is. Uh, you know, a, a, a momentum feeling. Because they don't care about the regulators. They care about the competitive market with each other. That's, that's actually a great point. And it's so true is that what we've noticed in starting Seafood for the Future, where initially we had a couple restaurants, now we're up, you know, up to 75, 100 restaurants. And yeah, because they talk among themselves up there in five. Exactly, and exactly. Uh, and we've had, we have a lot of chefs that are like, well, what, what are the other guys doing? Yeah. And then it gets to the point where some of the meetings is, well, you know, how many items on your menu are sustainable? And then the chefs really want to get to that point competing with each other. So that's why some of these, there almost seems to be, um, you know, what's happening is you have the government pressure and then you have some, some of this private enterprise that's going into it and then the NGOs and all working together in addition to the restaurants to encourage that competitive yeah, that market. tipping point, because exactly. once it gets there, then it's an in thing. Yes. And then they'll reprint their menus and go all the way. And it needs to be, and it needs, it's an in thing in that the restaurants are doing it, but then you have other restaurants that are, that are, are angry that there are people coming down on them so hard. The Greenpeace and some of these really you know, staunch environmental groups are coming down there, so then their rejection of green pieces to say, well, we're, you know, we're just going to be as little, not have much transparency, so. Dave, come on up, because I want you to talk. Sure. Let, let, let me respond. Well, to you. Question, don't you have, I have kind of the same fear about, and maybe it's totally unfounded. I, I mean, I don't like factory farms when it's, a, when it's a beef, a cow farm, and I have the same feeling about fish. I mean, I think eating salmon in season is the way to do it. And that maybe cheap, you know, I, I don't know, I, that eating in season and locally is the best way to, well, I think whether it's fish, whether it's vegetables, or. But I want to give personal answer, and I want you guys to, but as we heard from Russ Parsons and these two guys, chain of custody and the foods that we eat is a big issue. And except when you go to a farmer's market, and there you're taking it on faith, but probably there's good, pretty good reason. You, you don't know the chain of, of custody, <coughs> and you have things that are mixed. You neither know the conditions under which it were grown, or the, the conditions that the people who grew the food, how they were treated, the wages, et cetera. And I think it's a big issue. In ag agriculture, we're, we're stumbling towards sustainability. As Russ said, we're a lot better now than we were 10 years ago. I think in aquaculture, we're better than we were five years ago, we're, I think we're making less rapid progress maybe in aquaculture than in agriculture. But with, with buying only uh, wild salmon though, when it's in season, it would eliminate a lot of people from buying, have, eating salmon because of the cost. Salmon is one of the most healthful foods on the planet, omega-3 oils, and it isn't just for the, for the, the uh, cardiovascular system, we now know it's for the, the brain and, and lots of other things. So that, that that's one of the reasons I would advocate farming under the right conditions. We did a study off the coast of Southern California two years ago. We brought together the best minds and we asked the question, could you have sustainable aquaculture off the coast of Southern California? without do, do damaging the ecosystem. Because we've got 20 million people, the per cap consumption of seafood here is, is very high. The conclusion was that you could have a billion dollar a year industry with good jobs, with growing locally, species that are found here naturally. You wouldn't degrade the environment. You would protect what little of the working waterfront that we have left and that it could protect the wild stocks. And I'm going in on day one, the most severe critic was the Zeke Grader, who is the head of the commercial fisherman. And he said, there's no way I'm going to be convinced. In the last session, he stood up and he said, the people I represent will hate me, but I think California needs to do an experiment to see whether this works. It can be done properly. And if you looked at salmon being the shrimp number one, and they are probably the, the the ones that are, in terms of environmental damage, I would say shrimp farming 
has done the greatest damage, more, more environmental damage than salmon. Uh, and salmon is number two. There are a lot of bad salmon farms and terrible shrimp farms in the world. But if you could make sure what the chain of custody was, and if you bought from the good ones, then you let the marketplace move the others onto the right trajectory. And that's, that, that would have been the philosophy. So rather than carrying around something in your wallet that says don't eat any shrimp ever, uh, or don't eat any salmon ever, let's find what the right sources are <coughs> in, in five days. Now, you guys, I'll let you talk. Sure. Um, yeah, I don't know if I agree about the, about the shrimp, but certainly shrimp now is, is in a much better place than it was you know, 10, 20 years ago. A lot of the problems that, that they have with, uh, with viruses, for instance. No, I meant the environmental damage of getting rid of coastal coast mangroves and coastal wetlands. Yeah, yeah, that's a sticky situation, and look what we did with ours. Well, yeah, but, I'm not saying we're a great example, but... <laughs> but getting back to the, uh, to the point about, about the feeds, now, there, there are a lot of uh, marine organisms that, that will eat just about anything. You know, tilapia, uh, you know, you go to the koi ponds or whatever, you can throw those fish just about anything. Now, higher trophic level fish are, are more picky. And, and I think any of the husbandry people here would, would agree that uh, the carnivorous fish really, you know, they're particular about what they eat. Uh, and so, you know, you can't just feed them crap and expect them to grow. On top of that, farmers recognize that, that uh, feeding high quality feeds ends up with a higher quality product, and that's, you know, a higher value for them. So you see farms like, like Cone and Blue, they put a lot of effort into, into formulating a diet specific for that fish. They're not feeding that fish just any old pellet. It's, you know, the cheapest uh, whatever. So. Um, uh, my second point is about uh, other countries and, and other farms, uh, or, or farms in, in, in other countries. And, and what we're finding now is that uh, countries that recognize that aquaculture is going to be a major industry for them because they're sending all the shrimp to the U.S., because they're, they're sending uh, lhasa and, and uh, fish that do very well in Asia, they're recognizing that they need to come up with a, with a, a national aquaculture policy. And countries like Malaysia, like Thailand, they have. And so there, there are also uh, third-party certification agencies. One of the ones that we work with is called the Global Aquaculture Alliance. They're uh, for-profit, but, but Jerry's on their, uh, their scientific oversight committee, along with Monterey Bay, uh, New England Aquarium, SeaWeb. Um, uh, uh, so there's a number of NGOs uh, and so on. There's, their science is, is very solid. And what they do is they go out to, into, uh, to different farms for different species. They certify at different levels. So for the, the feed mill, farm, the processing plant for the distributor. By the time they're, they're finished, they have a four-star certified product. So that sort of, you know, is, is going to be an upcoming way of, of recognizing, uh, mainly for retailers and chefs, and not so much for consumers, but recognizing uh, which products uh, are doing a better job. It's a very comprehensive program. It's everything from, from measuring the effluent to are there enough toilets for the workers. It's every aspect of, of sustainability. Um, but what they are finding right now is that in countries like Malaysia, they don't have a whole lot of work to do because those countries are already doing a very good job. And in those countries, they have cooperatives of family farms, so very small farms that are operated at the family level. And those farms are sponsored by processors. And the processors will pay to have uh, those farms certified and to make sure they'll pass certification and so on. So that uh, you know, the, the, the processor wants to be able to pass uh, HACCP protocols and, and food safety issues. And then uh, you know, they, they, they make sure that the, that the entire uh, program is, is comprehensive in scope. Um, so these countries are, are already, you know, miles miles ahead of us. Um, I forget what the, uh, what the last question was, the last point was. Well, you're thinking on, on the, the, the fish that we harvest for fish meal and fish oil also. If you look at those, the, the, those amounts have not changed in at least a couple of decades. What has changed, and most of that goes to animal feed, chickens, cattle, and pigs. And there's been an, a, a new allocation with more of it going to aquaculture. And the point that you guys made is, Fish have much better energy efficiency conversion. Cattle are the worst. <coughs> Pigs are next worst. Chickens are, are, are the best. But fish are, are far better. And so it, it, it's not fair to really say that we're, we're harvesting fish to feed fish. It's the same fish we've been harvesting for 50 years. We're changing the allocation away from cattle. We have another question. I remember the, the point I was going to make. The number one reason, by far and away, the number one reason why uh, farm salmon is doing so well, why it's, why it's so valuable, and why it's selling so well, is because Atlantic salmon is commercially extinct. When you buy farm salmon, it's, it's 99% of the time it's going to be Atlantic salmon. When you buy Atlantic salmon, you guarantee it's going to be farmed because there are none left in the wild. 
So again, it's a, it's a matter of looking at the perspective has to include the fact that, uh, that uh, extinct species are now farmed. You know, we have stock enhancement programs. The future is gonna, it's always going to include fisheries. It's always going to include stock enhancement. It's always going to include uh, the, the farming of, of species from cradle to grave and, and any of the market like the Atlantic salmon are. We're going to have to drop our, our prejudices and recognize that this is part of, of what the market's going to look like. And Dave, I think you need to distinguish between biological extinction and commercial Commercial extinction, right. What about crabs and lobsters? Do they do that? Do they farm those? Yeah, those are tough because they have a, long, a longer a larval cycle. And they like um, to eat each other. And they like to eat each other, yeah. <laughs> but a lot of times what they do for, uh, for say, spiny lobsters is they'll put down a little, a little house called a casita, and, and the, the lobsters are attracted to it. So it's still, you know, sort of a, a form of, uh, well, not necessarily aquaculture, but they're letting, you know, they, they're, they, they uh, provide the habitat for the lobsters to live and reproduce. And then when they want lobsters, they go and they, they can see it. Obviously, if they took all the lobsters, then the, the uh, fishery would be empty. So it's that's definitely you know part of the solution as well. Yeah. I think one one thing to, to promote maybe a little better is um, I mean I can tell you I can't tell the difference between wild or farm when I eat it, but I I feel sure I can tell the difference between fresh and yeah not fresh. Yeah. And I mean I get I grew up in South Florida and, and here we have a lot of oranges, so I know what the orange juice is. <laughs> I did my PhD in Canada and the runty sorry excuses that they could pick green and get all the way up yeah. to Nova Scotia yeah. was no amount of, it didn't matter what the price is, I would just eat that. Um, and the same thing is they grew mussels there. That was a local thing. So they had fun with the dog. And, and sometimes the farmers would come in and like right off the farm mussels. And oh man, you can't. They're just amazing. You, you can tell. Or um, one of my first jobs out of uh, college was uh, Georgia Department of Transportation. So if, if you have a real Georgia peach, which don't chip, you stack three of them together, they, they explode. Um, <laughs> they, they, they're bred for taste and not yeah, yeah. to ship. And same thing with, with the salmon. It's, it's kind of local yeah. and it's not shipped all the way around the world. And all these, you can, I mean, there's a quality issue here too, which, which is actually a phase of farming if it's a if it's local. That's actually a great point that you make because I didn't want to get into this too much. But ultimately, the consumer's perspective, selfishly, does come down to quality. I mean, there's an ecological perspective, but they don't want to put consumers, we, I know, I speak personally and jump in if I'm wrong, we don't want to put something in our body that we don't think is high quality, especially when it comes to fish, PCBs, the, the feed, what's in the feed, antibiotics, and what type of hormones go into it to treat these particular diseases because they stock the density so high. So we think quality. So let's bring the conversation back to quality like you're saying. And I love to tell this story. So I'm a chef, okay, and I've got a party for 300 people, and I need salmon for 300 people. I want to serve, far, what, do I want to serve farm salmon or wild salmon? Well, for wild salmon, there's a season. They go out, they catch as much as they can, okay, regardless of the demand. They don't know where this is going. They catch as much as they can. They sit on the boats for upwards of 10 days sometimes before it actually sits in ice because the season is all the boats are out there. Then it goes to the processor. Then they process, cut, fillet. Then it goes to the distributor, and then it comes to the restaurant. Now. Let's say it actually stops at the distributor. They don't, maybe the demand is or isn't there. They can't determine that. Well, on the other hand, I need this for every party once every year. I call up my distributor. He gets in touch with the farm. They catch this, it goes, it goes in the water. Let's assume that this is a you know, sustainable farm. It goes essentially through this system back to the distributor and back to me. It can be in my restaurant in two, three days. And that, look at the control on that particular story. And that's, that's quality right there. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times what's happening with um, the decomposition of fish that they're serving that have high levels of histamines are that they're serving wild fish because they're fresh, because they don't want to freeze it, because they're afraid they want to kind of continue through the idea of, look, this is fresh wild salmon, when in actuality people are either getting sick or they're not necessarily getting a high quality product. And, that, and that's true of, of uh, sustainability in general, that's a big message that, uh, that we have, is that, for instance, you know, a, a fish that sits out on a, on a long line for several days dead before it's picked up or, or in a drift gill net, you know, the quality is nothing compared to a, uh, a day boat scallop or a line caught tuna that goes right on the ice and back in the, you know, the docks that night. So, you know, again, a sustainable product is typically the higher quality product. We're going to take Isn't that amazing? That, We're that's that's, that's not really interesting. Man? Yes, go ahead. And then Val here coming yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. I, I have a question. The one thing that, uh, one of the things that really interests me is the farming of abalone and what the status of that is. Essentially, no longer have abalone. Yeah, honestly, I can't speak extensively on that. There, you know, we do work with a couple of abalone farms. Um, there's uh, it's mostly red abalone, from, from what I understand, and there is uh, this great farm in the Big Island as well, as well at the same 
same site in Kona where they can, they can grow a whole block species. So they have a lot of Japanese, Japanese uh, black abalone there. But apart from that, uh, I don't think that there are any stock enhancement programs for abalone anymore. Because of the weather and the weather. I think there's are one they? up in Monterey. Yeah, it's close. Are they? Okay, there's a stock enhancement. For stock enhancement? I know that they do have to drop, jump through a lot of hoops uh, to, uh, to outplant abalone because of those disease issues. But apart from that, I don't know if that much about it. That one. It's clear we need to get the word out and network a little bit. Yes. <laughs> and. My question has to do with the 75 to 100 restaurants that you have online who are becoming believers in the process. Now, if we all know who those restaurants are. I don't. I know one, King's. And when people ask me, what's a good fish restaurant to go to, I always say, go up the hill and go to King's. But I get that question a lot, and I wish I had a whole lot more on my list. This is perfect that you asked this. It's almost like we planned this. Yeah. So, this is good. And here we go. It's starting to dance. So on our website, we have our list of restaurants, and that's updated um, fairly regularly. That doesn't work. Some of the restaurants are part of the corporation that go uh, nationwide as well. But here in Long Beach, we have, I think, about 25 restaurants. Gladstone is on board. Parker's Lighthouse is on board. McKenna's on the bay. Kabika's right over here. Um, we've got uh, the Maya Hotel Fuego right across the street. Uh, Nino's restaurant, actually Nino's, I went into Nino's with one of the first restaurants we had on the board. She said, I have no seafood on my menu, my chef doesn't know how to cook seafood. She goes, here's a pad of paper, write my menu. <laughs> and, and now on her menu she's got Wild Pacific Halibut and everything and she supports it. And the great thing is, we, uh, Russ talked about incentives. If there's, no, there's incentives to grow bland, tasteless food at high, uh, high quantities. But there's no incentives to grow, there's no real incentives to grow good, high quality food that tastes good because of the price aspect of it. So what we do at Seafood for the Future is we try and provide incentives to the restaurants to become a part of the program and then incentivize the consumer as well to go to those restaurants. So at all of our restaurants there, it's marked clearly on the, the, uh, the menu, the logo. So if you order one of those items, you actually get a coupon for a, a, a free entry to the Aquarium of the Pacific, which is, which is a $24 value. So, Tell them what Peter thought of that. Yes, so, so <laughs> well, it's actually it's a great point because Peter did come out and they said that uh, the aquarium promoting the consumption of seafood is like going to a dog show and being served poodle burgers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
change the market, you don't boycott a place. You start buying all the good stuff. And if you boycott it, then really what's going to happen is that people who don't go just come in and buy the same old stuff that they've always bought. But if you want to change the market, then you create an incentive for people to buy the good stuff. And then Trader Joe's will realize, hey, everyone's buying you know, this set of stuff for whatever reason. So let's keep those on the, on the shelves and get rid of this stuff that's not selling. And I think one point that's uh, relevant from that movie to this conversation here is, is that it really, um, and for those who haven't seen the movie, it's kind of a, a picture of the bluefin tuna fleets specifically coming out of Japan and how, number one, they're manipulating the numbers in order to overfish the species. Number two, this manipulation is being perpetuated by large corporations like Mitsubishi who are buying all the stocks of tuna, sitting on it like a mass commodity and then manipulating the price in the market. And number three, they came to the point that through this manipulation and through all this number fibbing and so on and so forth, the United States cannot control this market because over 90% of it is occurring overseas. And that's the, that is indicative of what's happening with aquaculture right now. 98% of all of the seafood that's consumed that's aquaculture is being, you know, is being farmed overseas, specifically in China and Asian countries. We can't control that. We'll never be able to control that. That conversation gets into something much bigger than, than seafood if we try and get into that conversation. But what we can do is, is that we can recontrol that market by accepting with open arms the right, those who are farming in, in, a, in a responsible, well-managed you know, techniques through those proper mechanisms here in the United States and increase that percentage, thus decreasing our trade deficits uh, you know, from a seafood perspective and then that can trickle through the whole economy. Now, all, of my, all of our animals and our friends eat restaurant-grade seafood. Yeah. Literally, yeah. it is bought from the same suppliers restaurants by far. Green, how much do you spend a year to feed Bruce? How much do you think we spend per sea otter per year? Who wants to make it? <laughs> per sea otter? 50000 No, it's 20000 It's $20,000. Those otters eat a heck of a lot better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Margaret. <laughs> some of this together, and it would be nice, I think, if each of us had one idea that we could share of things that we think, that we have learned, that we could live a more sustainable life. Bye. I'd like to thank you for writing that article on the paper. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a nice piece. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Good night.